think so. Yes, you don't. Thank you. This is a unique situation that this is not a appeal of a decision. This is kind of unique. We're asking for clarification on the issue. Uh, COVID has brought a lot of challenges and people have been trying to be creative on how they operate their business. And uh, one of them, as you have seen many places, the outdoor structures, tents, some have built fishing channies for food. I ate at uh, Little Traverse Inn and basically what is a little fishing sh sh shanty. Mm -hmm. Igloos have popped up and that's the issue here with igloos. And so there's some paradoxes in the law uh, that Sam brought to our attention, which is a legitimate issue. We're trying to get clarification on, on uh, the issue of what is a temporary structure and igloo whether it needs to be inspected or not, because the law says one thing, which I'll let Sam explain. And then there's another code in the law about safety that Amber's, Amber is the director of our construction code. It's now called Building Safety Department. Amber's been with us for eight years, I believe, and that's director now for a year, a little bit over a year. And Charlie Session is an inspector here. He's been with us for uh, how many years, Charlie? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. So it truly is a bit of a paradox in the law that Sam brought to our attention, which we're grateful for. So this is not a us versus them decision here. We're asking asking for clarification. We checked with our legal counsel, and it is a gray area. He suggested that by law, uh, the, construction, the construction code can make a ruling on it. So that's the purpose of this. So it's a unique situation than in the past meeting. Usually they have been an issue where uh, contractor or builder is challenging a decision made by one of the yeah. inspectors and by a director. This is not the case here. We're simply asking for clarification. Some of these issues surface. Amber and we have core inspectors? Core inspectors can get clarification on how to proceed with these issues. So I thought it would be helpful to Sam, you want to bring up your situation? And feel free to come up here. Uh, is it okay if I stay here? Well, we're recording it, so I'll oh, okay. so <clears throat> well, just introduce yourself and yep. you kind of give us an overview. Hi, I'm uh, Sam Simpson. I own uh, uh, Harbor Hill Fruit Farms for sellers in Harbor Vineyards. Um, and uh, we operate numerous retail uh, locations around the county and state. Um, the issue at hand, uh, the igloos, which are uh, temporary structures, um, as defined by the building department, um, were put up in the winter for us and numerous other businesses. Um, we, uh, or I, did not know that they needed a uh, permit um, for this. Uh, per the building code, uh, temporary structure is defined as something that it uh, houses 10 or a few people um, and is 120 square feet or more. So the Per the building department, this is regulated as a temporary structure, um, and igloos do not meet either of those. The igloos that we were using were 108 square feet, and they can only seat up to six people. So we uh, did not file a, a tent permit for these. Um, we did uh, receive a cease and desist from the building department, um, and then a week later, uh, before we had paid the $175 we received a fine. So we have two locations. So we were $650 into these tent permits um, for something that I don't view should need a permit because per the building department, it's a temporary structure. These don't meet either of those requirements. So um, I brought it up and uh, that was something that I was sent back for the, uh, saying that these were regulated as uh, temporary structures. and. I looked at it, I said, well, we don't need either of these. And then after a meeting um, with the building department, they then referenced another section of the code book saying that they have kind of a catch-all clause of uh, public safety for these um, that this would then fall under. So again, you know, <coughs> for clarification on this, $650 in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's not going to make or break the business, but it's still a lot of money um, for something that you know, we we pay for other temp permits throughout the year. Um, so to be paying annually for two different types of temp permits, I think is a little bit 
aggressive um, in the same calendar years. Um, that's why I'm here. Uh, just more of a clarification. If we, we've already paid all the fees and fines and everything, um, but I just think it's a little aggressive to have that in the code for businesses to be double paying if they're going to have tents throughout the year um, for something that shouldn't, in my opinion, uh, have regulation on it because it says clearly that it's a temporary structure and doesn't fall under that. So that's my position. I thought it would be helpful for Amber to give her views and with Charlie, and then you could have a dialogue between both sides, have any questions and so forth. Amber, you want to? Amber, and this was emailed to everybody, right? Yep, email and mail. Okay. So you all have a copy of more packet? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, it was mailed? Emailed. Emailed. Oh. Did you yeah. receive the packet? No, I didn't. Electronically, I thought you said emailed and mailed. No. There are a couple of folks that didn't have email, so I mailed the hard copy. Okay. That's fine. So, for the last four years, the department has required what we're calling seasonal use permits. That's based on the temporary structure section that was outlined in the department response sent to you guys. So, it's for tents as well as igloos. They're considered temporary structures. They come up, they go down seasonally. You see the tents come up this time of year, and then the igloos go up in the fall. So, the issue is if we have only one igloo, should it be required to have a permit or not? As Sam pointed out, with using one igloo, you are the lower standards listed in the temporary structures code section. However, when we've reviewed the packet here, we feel there is a safety concern and we have asked for permits on them regardless. That was all outlined in the packet to you guys. There's been electrical issues, there's been mechanical issues, uh, there's been issues not necessarily in our jurisdiction, but others further south facing these. That so out of an abundance of caution, you could say, based on the intent here, you feel that a permit should be required. They come up and come down every year. Things do change occasionally. Okay. Amber, what is what is the conflict here between the uh, Michigan Building Code and what you're proposing here? So for the temporary structure section, the use of one A group would exempt you from needing a permit. Based on our ability to require a permit as the authority having jurisdiction and asking that they will be exempted from the code, we're required to permit. Why the difference between one and more? There's no difference between, in our opinion, versus one igloo, 10 igloos, 18 igloos. The safety issues are the same for us. The drawings that, you should, that I see, saw in here, it looks like nothing is in there except uh, a few wires and according, there's no plumbing that I saw, although I saw electrical. And Charlie can speak to that better than I. He goes out in the field and he has seen these issues. Okay. Thank you. So basically, in a nutshell, Sam is saying by code, this is if it's less than 10 people, which the code does say that, right? Yep. Yeah, there's no debate on that, yep. that he does not have to get a permit. Amber's saying the other part of the law Talks is they have authority if, if there's a concern about safety or health of the occupants, which is what you're basing it on. I mean, in simple terms, that's the two issues. Yeah. Sam, if you want to come up here, because this is more of a dialogue here. Uh, sure. I guess the, the only thing I was going to add is it's a two part, so we need both parts, not just one. So it's 120 square feet or more and 10 or uh, fewer. So. So it's not just one part we need, it's actually both parts that we need under the temporary structure. So, so yours are less than that square foot? It's six, six people and 108 square feet. So it's not like we're just screwing by, it's literally both parts of the code um, that were referenced by the building department. We need both of them. Yes, yeah, one yeah. igloo is under the square footage limit and the occupant limit. But the occupant mode is? Six people. Two. Ten. Ten. The rule is ten. All right. I'll ask a question. Six people is based on what? The, how many chairs you put in there? How uh, many seat, what seating you have, or a restriction? 
What's to keep 10 people from going in? You couldn't physically fit 10 people in that space. I mean, it's, they would be, it would be very, very, very uncomfortable because they're not, they're not any larger than a, a tent that would sleep four people. So to put 10 people in there, I wouldn't go in, nobody with common sense would jam 10 people into 108 square feet. And the combination by way of barrier free, the threshold is what? Um, I, maybe I don't understand. What the entrance to the tent, to the igloo? There is, so in the tent, there is a door. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is zipper. Zipper. Um, and so there's, I mean, it's only 108 square feet, so there's only one door. Mm -hmm. um, the tent is also lightweight. Um, uh, I don't know if it's what the material uh, plastic. So if there ever was an issue, you could lift the tent up to get out. And it's, so it's not anchored with sandbags or stakes. Well, we did the way it described for for our sites that um, did have wind on it. We did put uh, sandbags on. Where in this county don't we have wind? Well, we, we, one of our locations is tucked lower, where you aren't catching the wind on an elevated plane. But there is a clear entry and exit, mm -hmm. and it's a decent size to work. Which so. the zipper is, starts at the bottom and goes up around. Correct. So it doesn't need barrier free. I don't. It, it doesn't need okay. barrier free. That was a statement, not a question. Okay. Fair enough. It, Okay. And you're heating it with? Um, I do not know the answer on how they were heating those on the top of my head. I would assume it's electric heat, but I don't know that for sure. You do heat your tents? There, there is a package in there. There's a picture in there from your facility on F22 that had an electric heater with an extension cord laying on the ground. That's in your package. I didn't know which picture. Yeah, you know which. I'm sorry. That's <clears throat> from his facility. And we verified that the plastic PVC that's being used in skin is flame retardant per what um, the code would require me. I know it says yes. in the legal literature that it's flame retardant, but they don't quote based on what. ASTM study, LUL, or anything else, they just say it's flame yeah, retardant. Okay. And the igloos, the, the igloos mm -hmm. popped up. They, they, their original use, intended use, was backyard greenhouses. Mm -hmm. um, they started popping up all over the country, not just here. Um, and so we had a choice as a building department. So there were so many of them coming up and people were struggling to keep the businesses going that we had a choice. Look, we're not going to accept these at all. They're not made for commercial use. Or we can try to we'll, we'll get them permitted. Charlie, can you come up here just because we are recording? We, uh, we can get them permitted, do a safety inspection, try to make it work and be as safe as we can make it for the public to be in. And the only way we can do that is through permitting and an inspection. Um, they don't really, they don't meet egress. We, we require them to be sandbagged or anchored down so they don't blow into the neighbor's yard or out into the road. Um, there's a lot of safety issues that you really don't think about. Um, put six people in there, set the door closed. Now we're heating it, and you know they don't vent. There's no ventilation in them, so you know you can have carbon monoxide issues. You, you know, so I felt I've been a building inspector for 20 years. Yeah. We're really stretching it for safety, even using these. But everybody was using them, so let's at least permit them, do a safety inspection, and try to make them as safe as we can, and people can. State in their business. And I just I want to make this a brief statement. And that's that I'm not anti business. I'm not opposed to businesses trying to, especially what we just went through with COVID, trying to 
maintain their operations wherever we can. My concern is safety, barrier free, and I know there's a tube that goes around the bottom and you're going to be rolling over it if you were in a wheelchair if you could even get through the door. And I'm not sure, couldn't find the dimension of the door anywhere in any of the literature. But you'd be hard put, well, if you're confined to a wheelchair, to get down, unzip the door, and then I'm not sure if you can roll over the tube that would account for the threshold of the door. Um, that can be dealt with with equal accommodation somewhere else within the facility, which is an ideal, but it does meet the intent or as a blank. Um, I'll let others discuss it. I, I think we want to hear more questions than just mine. I'm, I'll go on record right now as saying I'm not opposed to having an inspection of any, any of them. So, can I ask you a question? Sure. So, if you require a permit, um, and which they have been, that tube has not been required to change. So, what does what does that accomplish at this point? It would ask a question during permitting um, of equal accommodation. But that question hasn't been asked to date. Then maybe it should. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not challenging with our building department doing in terms of what they've done so far. Maybe since very free is requirement of the code that needs to be examined as well. It's like any other point of discussion when you come forward with an issue, it usually opens up more issues. So barrier three may be one of those additional issues that it opens up. I understand that. Um, the, the issue, I guess, one of the larger issues is with that definition that they're referencing after temporary structures would say that this shouldn't be regulated is a slippery slope. So it basically opens up Pandora's box where a building department can go in and say, well, I don't think this is safe. You know, and then all of a sudden that can snowball on itself. So, I mean, it's pretty clear in the language that was written that these don't meet either of those. So if you leave a catch-all phrase in there, then you can have an inspector that, or, or a department that decides that they want to inspect everything because in their opinion it's not safe. That's a slippery slope. If it's a public accommodation, safety becomes an issue. And appropriately so. It's not private use within someone's backyard. And I don't believe the building department's suggesting that if you want to put one in your backyard, you can inspect it. But if it was if it's for public accommodation, which that's what it is, right? Correct. Right. Then public safety becomes an issue. And that's what it's appropriate. In the introduction in, in all your code books, ICC Michigan code books, um, and that and that comes right down to what you're saying is that the whole reason we have codes consistency is for public health, safety, and welfare in in public structures. Um, and the state does, I feel give me the authority if I walk into a business and I see something that's unsafe, I have the authority to get a hold of that owner and say, hey, we've got a problem here. Let's whatever the problem is, let's get the the right person, the right engineer, the right somebody to come in and look at this to make sure it's not a problem or that if it is a problem we can make it safe. That that that's my job as a building inspector. Um, that's my opinion. Um, I don't think we can, we can't make these ADA. No, I, I don't know. You know, and so that was kind of a, again, as a department, we're trying to keep these businesses going. 
they're going to use the AUs. Let's let's do it like you say. They've got the facilities inside the building that can be used for ADA. You know, we can work with it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the idea of not when we have something used that isn't the norm that we need to be at least looking at it to know that it's as safe as we can make it reasonably not too costly and everybody's comfortable with it you know to that point we're also not the only jurisdiction in the state with requirements um, we may have been one of the first ones that started with the program and because there was a jurisdiction for the south I had started calling the northern folks and asking, have you seen this? What are you guys doing? Um, because there, it is a safety issue across the board for everybody. There are people using the port, but the COVID really pushed the issue. And they were really cool. So environmentally, people were looking for other ways to be able to draw people to the business. I have a question concerning that this looks like a panel box. Electrical panel box. Mm -hmm. How close is it to people who are going to be sitting in there? What, what we're having to do with uh, even the big event tents, igloos, uh, um, the electrical doesn't allow you to use an extension cord. So even with the igloos, you have to run an underground wire, put it in a weatherproof box on a pedestal. Then you can take like a picture of that electric heater that's in the tent. You can plug it in to an outdoor outlet that's GFI protected. That's the that's why that's there. That's the the cold proper way to provide power to these tents. This is it the National Electric Code you're talking about? NEC. Okay. Can the fire resistance of the skin has been resolved in terms of fire exposure or fire risk? We they have to be certified uh, fire retardant, which we haven't really seen one yet that wasn't. Um, we did have one at yeah. another jurisdiction in Ferguson from California. Right. We wanted to use that and told they couldn't use that. We had looked further at the garden and blue stuff. And that did so okay. And I, and I couldn't find, other than the statement that they said they were fire resistant, I couldn't find any. The, the building code requires a, a fire extinguisher too in, in every tent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Now, the reason for uh, not requiring a permit for one tent as opposed to multiple tents. Is that because of safety concerns? Yes. Um, could you identify the safety concern when, when it becomes multiple? I, I don't think there's any difference be, between one igloo and ten. Oh, okay. Um, it's the same concerns. Every time when I go up for a safety inspection on a tent or an igloo, I usually find extension cords or we don't have a fire extinguisher there 90% of the time on my inspections. Uh, and we tell them that stuff up front when they get to the permit, what they need. So my personal opinion is we need a permit for whether it's one igloo or 10. Okay. Uh, there's, and there's no difference in my mind of it. Okay. Um, well, and I, I appreciate that. Because I couldn't understand whether it was a number of egress or people or or what. Um, okay. Yeah, elaborating on that uh, with another facility in Sun Bay where they have 20 degrees. Wow. Yeah, we need we get into spacing and egress pathways. You know, we can't just have these things blocked on top of each other. Uh, so yeah, it gets chaotic. And again, we're, we're looking at safety. How do we get people out? How do we get emergency people into somebody? Yeah. You know. I, can, I can reach it. Is that, is that the hot lot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd be familiar. Those are larger than the university. Yeah. 
They're the first ones that were the size of the earth, but they bought they bought bigger ones that are over 100 tons. Yeah. Okay. I have another question. How temporary is 180 180 days? Can you just attach to that one and make another 180 days, or do you have to do something different? There is language if you want it to go a little bit longer than the 180 days. The 180 days starts the day of the approval permit. So if uh, it's usually half a lot, actually, it's most folks take them down sooner. But if you wanted it up longer, you do have to submit a request in writing to extend. How long can you extend? For an additional 180 days. I'm just wondering if there's just cascades into a number of 180 days. Well, at some point they do come down too. I mean, this time it is not conducive to putting an igloo up. You don't want to get it out. You don't want to be in the time winter time either. Well, and then, yeah, and Sam's and the same thing. They they put up their big tents in the summer to use the igloos in the winter time. Yeah. I read something else. I wondered, I saw something else in one of these drawings where there are wires along the ground. What are they? I see this one, but that was uh, there's this one, but there's another one. This this one is Sam's place on 22, um, and that was going to an electric heater. Yeah. How long is that wire? Uh, that's probably a 50 foot of an extension cord. It will say that is not for code. No, that's an NEC that's that's violation. Right. Yes. And the way to resolve that, like if he knows where he's going to put his igloo every year, then you would run an underground wire with an outdoor box and pedestal so that you can plug directly into a GFCI outlet with the heater. So it can be remedied. You operate this thing in the winter time? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. My staff does, yeah. And that's really all you're proposing it for. It's cold weather, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, it normally goes up in um, the end of November uh, and uh, comes down probably in, I would guess, March, March or April. So, and this year may be different. What's that? This year, what are the different? Yeah. Depending on the weather. It tends to be groups that will go ahead and advance reservations. Um, it's, it's another dimension that people enjoy. Is there a reason you choose, choose an igloo? <coughs> uh, because you didn't want to have it inspected, apparently. You didn't want exact inspection of, of all the uh, utilities. Is what? It, are you proposing that I chose the igloo because I didn't want it inspected, or is that the question? Not really. Okay. I, want, I want to know why you chose it. Um, is there a reason you chose that? They're uh, uh, commercially they're readily available. Um, they're reasonably priced. Uh, I think each igloo is around $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there tends to be a group of people that enjoy using them. There's also a group of people that do not enjoy using them. We tend to find it's, um, it's generally the uh, 25 to 40 year olds that enjoy using them. Okay. So people your age. Why? Anybody have any questions? So basically, your task is Amber through her. Duties and predatory made a decision that permits are required. <clears throat> Sam is saying by the code that he interpreted that they're not required. So you as the board have to either agree with Amber's decision or override it and agree with Mr. Simpson. In simple terms, that's what it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're asking for clarification yeah. going forward. Will we continue to require permits for all inputs across the board or is somebody it, it isn't just one igloo, it would not be not part of it. Well, I, hold on, I, I don't know if that's the, if, if the igloos fall, if the igloos fall underneath the current um, right. regulation, so for example, like Hot Lot, their igloos would need a permit because they're over 
the over the temporary shelter um, requirements. I'm, I'm proposing things that fall under the regulation for temporary structures, which are you know under 120, and for fewer than 10 people, you would not need a permit for those. Based on the 108 code. Correct. And it's not it's regardless of if it's one or ten, you know, those the uh, if the igloos by the code book say that you know they fall under a temporary structure, um, they should not require a permit. If you want to do something more like larger, like hot pot, um, that can seat ten people, but the pen are larger than 120 square feet, those under temporary structures should be permitted. Okay, and if I mean, if you were going to put eight of them on the lot, would you hold that the spacing of those would not be subject to review because one of them doesn't? Uh, this, so I, I don't know if I understood your question. Okay, what you're suggesting that because it's under 108 square feet, it doesn't require review. Correct. Inside the tent. Understand that. So the number of them on the lot would also would still would not change that. Um, you're you're I'm asking both of you. Yeah, we would say anything more than one is the two. Now you're you're over the one point. So if you're if so you you're, you're, add, total, you're you're adding the square footage together. It's not a single, each one wouldn't be viewed as a single. Correct. We would do it on a total scale. Because they would be used in conjunction. You're not using just one, you're using all eight of them. So the eight together mm -hmm. is a different total occupant load and total um, square footage. Okay, I didn't understand. I don't know. I mean to me if an igloo is it's a tent in itself. So it's not like it's not like sixteen people could use the same igloo. No, no, no. What my question, and I think Amber has answered for the county, and I, I totally agree with that. But if you put, is your is your thought that if you had two igloos, you'd still be exempt? My understanding, which apparently is different, would be that each tent is regulated, each igloo is regulated as a temporary structure per the temporary structure because it's it is a standalone unit. So the distance between them wouldn't be subject to review either. The access to them wouldn't be. Under review either. I didn't see any regulation in regards to the distance between them, but that that, that maybe I'm incorrect there. I there is code requirements for that. Okay. Yes. What was the answer to that? There is code requirements. You know, I'd have to look it up, but it's three feet or five feet apart. Oh. Uh, distance between the tents. Yeah, it's all in 2014, the proper rule. Um. Unless there's more discussion, I'd like to make a motion. I have a question. Can you pull a permit if one's not required? <clears throat> I mean, at this point, they're not required. So I guess if you were to change it, someone wanted to anyway, yes. You still could pull it. Yeah, sure, there's no good to ag. If somebody has an ag building right now, they're not required to pull a permit. But if they wanted to anyway, they certainly could. If they wanted the inspections on a building or, you know. You'd go in and sure. look for Fire alarms, smoke alarms, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> so just to clarify, Mr. Simpson made a comment about what happens if an uh, inspector or building official goes too far the decisions. <clears throat> and that's why the law states there's a construction court board of appeals that individuals can apply yeah. for decisions. And that's your role. And that's actually in the law. I as an issuer cannot override a decision made by the building official. The code spells it out. From there, the next step is there actually is a state construction board of appeals. So whatever decision you make, in theory, either party could appeal that to the state board of construction appeal. We actually had that two two years ago, where it went up to the state board, and they agreed with the decision made by this board. They asked made a decision, and this was on a previous bill that showed the incident in Luna Township. So that's why the law is there to protect both sides. So back to your question, anytime. Uh, individual or contractor or homeowner or builder disagrees with a decision made by the building department, there is a appeal process to have that checks and balance in place. And it's clearly sped off by law. And that's why the 
four of you are here this morning. Do they have to put a bunch of notices up by these? I mean, if I come in this building, there's all kinds of notices, nobody reads them, but or understands them, but they're there, and that has some value. I'm not sure it has a three hundred dollars or whatever, but if I don't know anything about these, but if I went somewhere and I saw one was approved and one wasn't, I might put my children in one, or I might put a one, or hopefully there's some value to that. I don't know that there is, but there should be. There's a, there's a process for violations and posting the stop work order. Um, you know, we have to send letters, post structures. Yeah, there's a process in here. We uh, we typically don't don't go up with the big red stop work order on something until we've had we've sent letters, we've had dialogue with the people who are trying to work things out with first because like you say, if somebody walks up, sees this big red stop work order, gets everybody's attention. So we try to work there before we get to that point. Mm -hmm. Have we got all our questions answered? I had a, I had a question. Yeah. Um, now on the multiple from one or more, it goes, is part of that the spacing? Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm thinking about in the multiple is coming back to safety. And Bob is Bob will look at and, and emphasize, and, and that's what we do. Do you have a, Amber, did you mention a five foot dimension between the engloses? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to look it up. Well, that's okay, but yeah. there is. There, there is, is a spacing requirement, obviously, for access for emergency people. For you know, okay, uh, a heater catches on fire in one, you don't want it up against another. So, right. So, that, so those those requirements may be a factor of difference between one or more. Okay, okay. I, I understand that a little better then. Yeah, there would be additional things we do with that when there's more. Yeah. Like how might you ask that? Okay. Yeah. Not a question, but I'm not sure how to ask this. If you have multiple igloos, uh, how are you wiring them? Are they wired together, wired separately, and who inspects them? Um, with the spacing, you probably have to have multiple outlets done, and our electrical inspector then would go out and look at that stuff. The electrical inspector does all the electrical and all the structure building stuff, and the plumbing mechanical guys do their. Is um, when you have more than one igloo, you've got a different current draw. Is, is it, you have one igloo. Is that included in your inspection? It, it's a different one. I didn't hear what it means. Well, I'm just saying, if you have one, you you got so much current draw. Mm -hmm. You have two of them, didn't know them. Yeah, if they're going to have electric heaters. Uh, actually, Hot Wheels uh, uses uh, uh, yeah. propane heaters, and they actually run ductwork and heat them that way with forced air. Uh, actually, over at Aurora has a, a little forced air heater, propane heater. So, yeah, if it was electric, they might need more than one circuit. Uh, again, that's why we start getting into, oh, you know, you need an electrician, you need some design. Uh, you know, Hoppelot's a good example of that. That's a big area um, where we have, you know, architects involved in occupant load and, and the spacing mm -hmm. and everything down there. So, um, you know, SAMS is a smaller issue, but the electric is you would still treat it the same. Anybody else? Okay, the next step is if you don't have any questions for them, you debate among yourselves, and then there needs to be a motion. And because there's five of you, you still need majority, so three of you have to agree. A 2 2 vote does not pass any motion. What happens if there is a 2 2 vote? It just drops. Then it stands by Andrew's decision. Because you're okay. Variety. You need a majority, and that's five of you. There's five of you, so it's not a majority president, it's majority. Well, it's Either way, you need three votes. 
Uh, you want to start the discussion now because you would. I would at this moment really like, I'd agree that it should be reviewed, it should be permitted uh, from the standpoint of public safety, whether it's one or a dozen. Um, and based on public safety alone, I, rec I agree that the, as the code's written, the 108 square feet does exempt it, and I'm taking, uh, you know, your calculation as 108 square feet. I didn't see it anywhere in the literature, but higher square, we can figure it out quick enough anyways. Um, and as part of that inspection, it's a life safety issue. Um, as related to fire and egress, barrier free would come into it as well because that's addressed in the code and that's appropriate. The fact that a igloo wouldn't meet it as long as it's accommodated elsewhere within the facility, that it's auxiliary building for the facility, barrier free should not be a real issue. If you were relying entirely on igloos of any size and they didn't meet barrier free and that was the only accommodation you had, then you've got a different, you're dealing with a whole different portion of the code. Um, I think it should be reviewed by the building department and the permit must be required to cover the cost of that inspection and all the follow up that goes with it. And recognizing your your concern that the building official gets carried away and wants more than is required by code, that's what this board's for. There are avenues for that. I mean, same way as a, a police officer stops you and writes you a ticket because you he, you he says you're one mile over the speed limit and you're not, you go to court, you get it adjudicated. It's we're not assuming that a building official is going to overstep their powers. And they are for the good of the community and welfare of all of us. That's my thought. I'm just concerned about the uh, safety and cost. I mean, I don't know if that's a good shouldn't probably be brought up here, but I don't know if that's a good, like if I was this gentleman and I had this inspection, I'd feel a lot better than the guy down the street that didn't. But I don't know if it's worth the money because there's no, it seems to be no end to it. I mean, you put the, you put the uh, fire alarm, smoke alarms and things in there and the next year the code changes and nobody seems to follow up on it. I mean, I see it all the time in my area, people doing things without codes and inspections but I still want to be on the other side, even though the person, somebody's taking advantage of it. And you did mention it wasn't a hardship for the money, so it's, maybe it isn't. To me, it doesn't seem like a good value, hundreds of dollars for well, something. Was the total, that, that 650 figure was his, his after the fact extra fees too, that's not the normal No, it's cost. 175 per per minute. We, we got a three, we got, it was $300 a week after, literally a week after we got the stop and cease and desist, we were then whacked with the fine. There's documentation that tracks our correspondence with Sam. We, per approval by the county board, can assess an after the fact fee that we're done without a permit. When the communication stopped, the fee was assessed. When the second angle went up, a month later after knowing permits were required, it was automatically assessed. Of the Can that be waived in any way? Uh, prior to that, it's at my discretion. Given that we've already gone through it a month and you need it for that, it was my opinion it, it should be assessed. They were up at the same time. But then next year? Next year would not. It's, it's, it's just it's a one time that. deal. No. And we do send out reminders at the beginning of each season to everybody that's done it in the past or expressed interest, reminding them that permits are required. You may be assessed and after the fact fee if it's put up. It's case by case. I treat everybody fairly. I'm not going to charge you additional fees as long as you're in communication with the department. We can work things out. Once the communication stops, I'm going to assess the fee. 
So it's, it's one, it is one permit for the construction this year and next year, it's, as long as it's not a modification, there's no new permit. There's a new, there is a permit every year because the structure is put up again. We have to look Okay, I wasn't sure I understood you. So, and the reason for that, you go in to see if the stuff is there because you could move it to the next tent or not have it. There. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, the tents are <clears throat> moved, they're not even put up in the same place. You know? Yeah, with all that's not there, or the smoke alarms, or signage, or walkway, or whatever. A thousand other things you probably has to go through. So, just, just we're paying the tent permit twice a year at one of my locations. So uh, in the same calendar year, you're paying it twice a year for uh, two different types of tent, um, which at one location, we're paying that fee every year, and those tents have not changed in eight years. Let me add you're something. You're not putting the igloo. We're talking. Yeah. I'm just saying that in the igloos have not changed year over year, so. But they come up and go down. And they come up and go down. But why would they go up and go down in the same? Twice in the same year. So we, we have different tents for spring or for summer. Or right. your, your tents, not the igloos. It's right. I'm just days. saying you're paying the tent fee twice a year from a business perspective. So that I'm you, just, I would view that as a cost of doing business. Do you have to uh, have an electrical and all the different inspections, or is it just one? I mean, you have to have the electrical inspected it in the building and the structure. It's only building unless you have other components. If you have any electrical be done, you're the business. Yes. Uh, example, a hot lot, you know, was expanded. So they did expand their electrical. They did a bunch of electrical work. Um, Sam should do some electrical work and put some outdoor outlets there for his igloos. Um, so when that initially gets installed, the electrical inspector would go out with the electrical permit and look at that at installation. Then it's there. So then, when now we're just dealing with the igloos going up and down or the summer tents going up and down, that's just one inspection by the building inspector for say Yeah, I see. That seems to be a secondary question. Uh, we're discussing about the uh, viability of the, of the uh, inspections themselves, not the cost of them. The cost is covered by the county board, so you're not involved with that discussion. All right. The fees are set by the county board. So I have anything else to say. If all your questions are answered, your next step would be someone would have to make a motion. It would have to be second. And that motion would need three votes. Uh, I would make a motion. I would make a motion that the appropriateness of the permitting process is correct and to benefit the public safety and it's part of doing business. I accept that thinking because you okay, there have to be a second first, I'm sorry. Second. And then come back. Go ahead. Keep second. Okay. And now you can have dialogue among yourselves. For I agree with what you're saying too because uh, I see some wires on the ground over here. Mm -hmm. Nobody inspects them. And that's just part of the safety. That's why you have inspections. Uh, I, I don't know about the wording, but to explain it's pretty good to me. Anybody else got any other views? Uh, I, I did have a question. Now, um, this permit is for 180 days, Correct. Um, and that defines a temporary. Um, and the purpose is that it's going to be taken down. Um, and what's the difference if that is there? For 250 days, I, I'm. Uh, I'm just trying to understand some of the innuendos of permitting, which I've been involved in for so long. Um, we might have to look at permitting it in a different way. Uh -huh. Temporary structure, if it's not intended 
99% of these are intended to go up, you know, the big tents go up in the spring and come down, and the igloos go up in the fall and come down. In the spring. Okay. And um, you did say you could extend, they could the request an extension. Um, maybe we have a nice fall and they can get another month. Yeah. Oh, extend. okay. So that could be extended. There's not a relative. Okay. That answers so my question. You could not extend the igloo permit into the tent season. So if you're going to take it down, we wouldn't morph it and now it becomes approval for a tent. Okay. okay. We have permits there. Oh, they are the same type of permit, but one is for tents. Those go up in the spring. Okay. And then there's a different one full for it was It's a timing. It's based on timing. We have some folks that put them up, that put both tents and they lose up at the same property. We have other folks that do one or the other. Okay. And it's two separate permits because you're reviewing okay. different criteria. Yeah. So basically it's a six months. Okay. Took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Any other That's okay, thank you. I'm gonna figure out wording for this. By the way, before I even go any further, can you hear us? Yeah. I want to make sure. Yeah. So the motion has been seconded. You just, yeah. if you're done discussing, just vote. Okay. So I can read the motion back if you'd like. Okay. Motion by Miller that the appropriateness of the permitting process is correct and benefits the public safety and is part of doing business. And I have seconded by Palachi. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Oh, with the vote. Uh, now I take a vote. Call for the motion. Yeah. I think that's a term. Call for the motion to be voted on. Yeah, I think that. Please, a motion. No, no. Well, he, he, just, he just called to ask for a vote. Oh. So you can take a vote. I would like to have the board make it, take a vote. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of the motion. All right. Aye. Are you uh, yes or no? I'm not voting. Okay. If you don't vote, it's a no vote. You still need three yes votes. Yeah, I think they have three. Okay. So for the record, three yes votes, one abstain. Correct? Yeah. Okay, so the motion passed. The motion passed. All right, what do we got now? There is no old business, so next would be public comment. Oh, yeah, public comment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Most time, Terry. And you, as Chairman, can adjourn the meeting. I want to call for an adjourning of the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you for everyone who attended and express your viewpoint. Thank the, bo you. the board did change our policies last year, so you were entitled for a stipend and mileage reimbursement.